as we wait for this to. Okay. So my name is Henry. I'm uh, at MediaTek, and I have two pieces of a presentation. The first one is like the marketing, what's MediaTek, and then the second piece is probably the more interesting piece, which is uh, a project that my team worked on uh, that relates to uh, software-defined radio. Uh, I brought a prop, which is a software-defined radio. Unfortunately, uh, so the good news is that this actually is a MediaTek uh, inside chip. The bad news is that it's actually not the, uh, the, the, uh, the DSP that the project I'm talking about is about. Because when I asked the local um, uh, support guy if he had a phone that had a 93 uh, uh, DSP in it, he said, no, how about this one, which is a 92. Uh, but if you want the, 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 the actual modem, I can give you several different uh, uh, phones that you can uh, buy on um, eBay or Amazon uh, if, you happen to, uh, if you're curious or interested. So MediaTek is a fabulous semiconductor company. Um, you know, we're number four is not really a, um, a good tagline, so we'll skip that. Um, <laughs> number four tries harder? You know, I don't know. Uh, uh, what number four means is about just under $8 billion in uh, annual revenue last year, um, which is, again, I guess nothing compared to uh, selling chips at uh, uh, McDonald's. Uh, as far as the company goes, they like to divide, uh, say, the, the product areas are split into about one-third, one-third, one-third. Um, the one-third that we care about is uh, listed here as mobile computing, which includes tablets and smartphones. And we're, uh, we're all smartphone-based uh, stuff. Uh, as uh, R&D type people in the room, we probably care about R&D and R&D spending. And wow, that's a terrible color. Cool. Uh, <laughs> So the upshot is uh, MediaTek uh, uh, spends just under $2 billion a year, or at least spend just under $2 billion last year um, in uh, R&D, however the heck they define it. Um, so uh, non-trivial amount. Uh, about 24% of revenue, which is a non-trivial amount. Uh, the company is worldwide. It's all over. It's based in Taiwan, as, you, uh, as I mentioned, but it has sites in lots of different places, including the U.S., uh, in the U.S., there are sites in the East Coast, the West Coast, and in Texas, uh, uh, roughly 400-odd people total, of which 70 of us are, in, are local in Massachusetts, in Woburn. Of that 70, again, we split about one-third, one-third, one-third between um, tools, GUI languages that are used for uh, firm, uh, basically firmware development for some of the, uh, the uh, modems, uh, about one-third is analog design, and about one-third is other. Other is things like operations, HR, customer support, um, IT, yada, yada. And that's the end of the marketing. So what I, uh, I thought I'd try to do a presentation or talk about something that's completely different than uh, probably everything else that, uh, that you're going to see, which is, you know, uh, building one of these is a very complicated task. Uh, it involves literally thousands of people. Um, and the, um, the project has many, 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 many parts, including RTL design, firmware design, uh, uh, you know, algorithm design, porting algorithm to firmware, uh, design verification, uh, just many, many, many parts. Uh, I thought I would talk about a, uh, a, a part that our management doesn't mind us talking about, which is uh, a, a specific project that we did to help do help the, the design verification task, so basically proving that the RTL code was correct for a, um, the, the DSP that's used in one of the, uh, uh, of the modems. The, uh, the particular modem, uh, we could talk about a, a little bit if you're really interested. But it basically goes into, it's a multi-mode and goes into uh, specifically LTE, WCDMA, CD, uh, TDS CDMA, and yada, yada. So all kinds of different uh, standards. So what we were doing, uh, oh, by the way, I should say, this, this particular talk, one of the reasons that I'm uh, giving it is because I had it available. Um, it's actually about a, a talk for a paper that uh, John and I wrote that we're going to present at the uh, Synopsys user group meeting in about two weeks. So I just repurposed the slides. 
Okay, so we're talking about using uh, System Verilog, which is a, a, a design and test language that's used mostly for hardware, to test the C models for uh, C models of the processor designs that, that we write. And an interesting twist, or I think is an interesting twist, is actually from our design flow, both the System Verilog code and the C code, the C models themselves are all uh, automatically, are auto-generated from a, uh, a, a machine description, or from an instruction set description. So uh, outline of the talk, uh, motivation, like how did we get to where, where, where we got or what are we trying to do? Then I'll talk a little bit about the design flow of you know, this uh, auto-generation that, uh, that we're doing. Uh, a little bit about constrained random testing and in particular where our constraints came from and how do we, you know, how do we, uh, where, do we get, where do they come from and what do we do with them? Then uh, talk ab about uh, some stimulus reuse. What are the test benches for the C++ code uh, look like? And then some other aspects of reusing other parts of the, um, of the design flow that, uh, and, of course, um, some results. Why do we think this is a good idea? So motivation. Um, I, our team, my team in Woburn is responsible for uh, development, writing, and supporting the C models for multiple different uh, DSPs uh, that are used in the, uh, in the modem parts. The reason for the C models originally, or how we got here, is um, th the original intent for all these C models was for firmware development, uh, for, you know, uh, for debugging and de uh, developing firmware, algorithm to firmware, that kind of thing. Uh, and the reason for that is basically that the C models are highly observable and they execute very quickly. So it's faster than trying to run um, RTL code. It's also the C models are available much sooner in the design flow, or in the design process. Um, but it turned out that since we had these C models already uh, available and that they can be run in a bit true mode that is uh, identical to the hardware, it became useful to uh, the DV guys started, uh, DV design verification uh, guys were, uh, started using them or were using them to test that the RTL code was doing the right thing. In other words, does the C code and the RTL code do the same thing? If it does, that's good. If it doesn't, that's bad. That's design verification. Um, Again, C code for processors. Um, the, the processors are programmable. That makes them somewhat easy to test in some respects because it's quite easy to stimulate them to make them do some, uh, some particular thing and then to uh, uh, observe the result. That's handy. Um, and then, okay, so uh, workflow. Basically, we're lazy. We're trying not to do more work than we had to do. Um, we're uh, trying to reuse things that we already had or to, to use things that we could uh, generate or create quite easily. Um, and then to go to the results uh, directly, the main benefit of what we're, uh, we're trying to do uh, or what we did here is uh, fast turnaround. So we can create new C models and new test benches and uh, et cetera uh, very rapidly, uh, especially compared to a more manual process that was used in the past. And the other substantial benefit has to do with um, finding errors in the design and bugs in the flow um, much earlier than we had been able to do in some past projects. And so we'll talk about some of all of those things. So this is kind of a high level picture of what the, the, the flow uh, uh, looks like or the implementation flow looks like. So we start with a handwritten but machine readable uh, instruction set specification that contains a lot of different information. And from that we go and generate a lot of different artifacts, including uh, C models and test benches and, uh, and some other stuff. Um, for the purposes of uh, uh, this talk, I'm basically uh, talking strictly about, or mostly about, the part of generating uh, system Verilog test benches that we then use to generate stimulus that we use to test our, our, our C++ code. Um, but we'll Anyway, I'll, I'll mention uh, some of the other stuff uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more. The particular processor that this talk is about has a complex instruction set. Uh, by that, I mean that uh, there are a lot of rules for what it means you know, for how to construct a valid instruction or a valid instruction sequence. Rules are things like. Uh, uh, this instruction can't immediately follow that instruction. Or if you're going to call this instruction, you have to use a register within this range, uh, uh, et cetera. So basically, uh, a, a, a lot of different rules um, 
for um, uh, for uh, for building a valid uh, program. Uh, I guess the other thing I should uh, th the the DV guys, uh, as I said, were already using constrained random uh, testing for other processors and for uh, uh, for other designs. Uh, one of the issues that uh, that they had or that we had with what they were doing is that their process they were um, uh, mostly writing well they were entirely writing their uh, their constraint models by hand by reading the hardware description uh, language figure out what it said uh, write a rule and you know and or write a constraint and uh, and have at it that's slow um, and somewhat error prone also our documentation tends to be poor uh, so it, it's kind of a voyage of discovery to do things manually. Uh, the other thing I guess I should say about this particular talk is uh, from the scope of the talk where it is strictly about functional verification. So we're not ta I'm not going to uh, spend any time at all on timing models and cycle accurate simulation and all, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, it happens, but n not here right now. Okay, so the rules I mentioned. Um, so rules come from uh, multiple different sources. Uh, we, we sort of tend to identify three. So we have rules that relate to the, uh, to the architecture of the processor. There are rules that relate to the particular realization of the architecture. Um, so sometimes people, uh, you know, the, the design undergoes changes from release to release for you know, different generations of the same processor. Um, sometimes things are done to the processor to make it go faster, you know, uh, increase or reduce the number of pipeline stages or, you know, add registers, delete registers, et cetera. So there are some, uh, some things that we distinguish basically between architectural uh, rules, uh, things that are specific to the, uh, the particular hardware, and then also thing, uh, rules that are specific to the instructions. So an example. Okay, so, sorry, I should have looked at my own. Um, uh, so. So given the rules, we're going to generate some system Verilog. So what you see on, uh, on the right is a system Verilog class. In this case, the constraint class for an add instruction. Um, I, should, I, I should also say there's a paper that goes along with this that I can send you if you want to. You can probably get it from Synopsys' uh, uh, website that goes through all of this in great detail and shows the, the, all of the code, or at least a substantial amount of the code. To make it fit on a slide, I had to delete a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I apologize for that. Anyway, so given the, uh, so we're going to take the rules that are on the left and we're going to turn them into a uh, system Verilog that's, uh, that's on the right. So we start with, uh, with a, uh, a system Verilog class and we create variables. So uh, random variables basically for the constrained random. The random variables have uh, uh, basically a type. In this case, the, the, the type of the variable, uh, you can't see that. Um, uh, is something called an FPR, which turns out to be uh, some sort of floating point register. The variable has a name, and then variables or types have attributes associate w uh, associated with them. In this particular case, the attribute index is the index into the register file of this particular uh, instruction operand. So that would be something like we call the instruction with register R0 or R1 or R3 or whatever, and the index would be that, uh, re that register index. It also turns out that this uh, uh, processor supports uh, uh, register groups, so c a, a contiguous group of, uh, of registers that are used by some instruction. And um, num, the attribute num, is the number of registers in that, uh, in that register group. So the, uh, the register group that's uh, uh, addressed by this instruction starts at register R2 and goes to register, is, is two registers wide, so it's register R2 and register R3. Uh, pretty common stuff. There are other attributes that might, uh, in, uh, that for example, uh, correspond to the number of lanes or the number of lanes that are being used in the SIMD register in, uh, in the processor, and so on and so forth. So there's a bunch of different kinds of registers and a bunch of different kinds of, uh, of variables that get created. From that, we then use them in constraints, uh, the, the system for all the constraint. And uh, so the constraint. We might have a rule, for example, that says that there are 32 registers in the register file. Okay, how that corresponds to a rule is if we're using this register destination in an instruction, then we shouldn't be using, uh, we should be using a register that's within range. We shouldn't be trying to use register 33 because there isn't one. 
uh, we shouldn't be trying to use a registered group of size 4 that starts at index 31 because that would go, you know, that's outside of the, uh, of, of the set of registers. These sounds like stupid things that no one would ever do in code. It turns out people sometimes do it in code. Um, anyway, so, uh, so we can translate a, a, a rule that says 32 registers into something that looks like this uh, little uh, clause in the, uh, in the constraint. We might have another rule that says that a register group has to be a power of two size. So you can do you know, uh, uh, register pairs or register quads, but you can't do a triple, maybe. And many other such things that, you could, uh, that one could conceive of. You can have a hardware restriction that has to do with the ports on the register file that, for example, say that for certain of these registers that the source and the de or certain instructions that the source and destination registers can't overlap. That is, you can't, uh, well, you can't use the same register for the, uh, the input and output and you can't partially overlap the, uh, the, the, the register groups uh, because something bad will happen. That can be translated into a similar constraint that basically, if we read this one, says, if you look at the index of the start, the, if the source register starts here, then the destination register had better start further up in the register file, far enough up to be outside of the register group that's used for source one. That kind of makes sense, so no overlap. That's one side of the, uh, of the, uh, the clause. The other side is, well, that's if the source starts here and the destination is here, but what about the other way around? The destination is here and the source is here. You know, basically overlap both directions. Uh, and so on. So a lot more uh, similar type of rules. Some instruction-specific type of rules were things like we have a, uh, an instruction that has multiple operands, and it turns out that for various reasons, the value of operand 2 has to betwe be between zero and whatever uh, the value in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, source one was, and so on and so forth. So there's a gazillion such rules, such constraints that can exist in the, uh, in the processor. We encode them in some machine readable form and then generate this um, rather verbose uh, uh, system Verilog code uh, on, uh, on the right. Can you write the system Verilog code manually? Yes, you can. Would you want to? Not so much, um, basically because you could make a mistake. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that if you have 32 registers in the register file now and the, uh, the, the somebody decides, wait, that's, that's like way too much area. Can you get by with 24 registers? Okay, change to 24, regenerate everything, we're good to go. Or uh, uh, you know, what have you. Okay. So now we've generated, uh, so we have the constraints, we have all the variables, and now what we want to do is we want to come up with, uh, we, we basically want a, a constraint solver that will give us valid instruction sequences or valid instructions that we can use uh, in our testing uh, purposes. For that, we have, we define some functions or some methods in the, uh, in the constraint class, um, these two in red, and we move along. Uh, so what are we going to do? Okay, so now we're going to uh, expand out these, uh, these different uh, uh, methods to see, you know, uh, to, to try to test the, um, the code. So, okay, so to recap, we start with an uh, instruction description. We're going to generate uh, a, a system Verilog test bench that looks a lot like this. We're then, uh, then going to run our Verilog simulator to uh, find constraint solutions, basically to solve the constraints and come up with input values that we can use on our, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, in our design. For the C model or for the RTL, it doesn't matter, it's the same. How are we going to do that? Right? How do we apply you know, Verilog input values to C code? Well, the obvious way is to use uh, PLI, Verilog PLI. I don't know how many people here are Verilog or hardware designers, but it's a, 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 a programming language interface to allow you to link C code into Verilog. Um, that sounds attractive, but actually we don't do that. Uh, the reason that we don't do that is, uh, uh, there are several reasons uh, having to do, well, uh, the two main reasons are uh, runtime performance, the PLI tends to be quite slow, and the other is license consumption. If we, uh, if we, if our test bench requires a Verilog license in order to be able to test our C code, then we're consuming Verilog licenses every time we're trying to uh, execute our, our, our C code regression test. That's not such a great thing. Um, our, uh, we're, we're sensitive to the licensing costs, basically. So what can we do instead? Well, we can be uh, sneaky. And what we can do is when we uh, generate a, a, a valid input value, we can 
use, a ver uh, use some Verilog code, like dollar display, to print the, the valid values into a file that actually is formatted to look like C code, or to be C code. So when we do that, we, uh, we'll, we're going to call this purple, I guess it's purple, dollar display, and it's going to print the values that, are, that the constraint solver gave us for the inputs to, the, uh, to this particular instruction and the values that it gave us for the, 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 the different uh, constraint value, uh, 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 variables that are shown in, uh, in purple. And of course, we can do that multiple times, right? We can generate more than one valid instruction. We can generate as many as we want uh, in, in this execution by just looping and asking for, give me another solution and another one and another one and another one uh, for as long as we want. If we're going to be able to use this, uh, you know, as, uh, as I said, we're going to compile this as a C++ code. So we're going to want some more glue around it to tell us which instruction is this and which variable does, uh, do each of these uh, numbers correspond to and their types and et cetera, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, having done that, basically we're going to, uh, this will be a little block of, uh, of uh, of code that we can then compile into our, uh, our, our uh, C++ test bench to test our C++ code um, is, uh, is uh, you know, one application. And you know, uh, as I mentioned, one, having generated this set of valid inputs to, uh, to, uh, uh, to exercise our code, we can then reuse that, th those inputs, we can reuse that, uh, uh, those, uh, that generated code as as frequently as we want, as you know, without consuming another Verilog license, uh, and in particular, we can keep running uh, our uh, our C++ test, test benches as we modify our C code, uh, as we modify the C models themselves. Why would we do that? Well, uh, mul multiple reasons. Um, so the other thing, if you look at the test bench, you'll see that uh, there's the, the the call to randomize is wrapped in an if block. The reason for that is that the, the system Verilog randomize call returns a status which says, true, uh, basically true, I generated something for you and here's the sequence, or false, uh, I failed. Uh, I was unable to generate, uh, I was unable to solve the constraint. Uh, and, uh, and then the question is, oh, you know, what are you gonna do about it? So a question you know, to think about is, uh, so why is it that the constraint solver would fail? Just a, just a question to think about. The C++ test bench that we use, so I, I showed you a, a small chunk of the, the, the generated values that, that, that come from System Verilog. The test bench itself is a little bit more complicated and is more than you really want to go through in a, um, uh, in, in a couple of minutes. It uh, uses a number of features of C++ 11 and 14 to make the code simpler or at least make it far more compact than it would otherwise have been. The basic idea is quite simple, which is we're, we, we're going to iterate through each of those instructions in that uh, instruction block that we generated and then iterate through every solution uh, that basically for every test sequence and uh, deserialize the solution data that is coded as, uh, as integer values, deserialize it into something that our, our C code likes to see, execute the instruction and then compare to a result or do something. And again, the code for this test bench is in the paper and you can get it if you want it. Okay, so why is that good? I mean, this does seem like the long way around the block. It seems like maybe we did a lot of work for, for, for what purpose? So the reason that it's good is that we get some uh, quite high coverage, high quality tests for relatively little effort on, on, on our part. And here is a, uh, a table uh, the coverage data for our uh, part of the module uh, uh, of the C code that we had generated some time back. Uh, this particular table looks like it was generated back in, uh, in January, so things might have changed a bit uh, since then. Uh, again, it's the same table that, uh, that, you, that you'll find in the paper, so you can look at it in a little bit more, uh, more detail. But the few lines at the bottom that have uh, uh, 10 or 20, uh, the, the files at the bottom that have 10 or 20,000 uh, lines of code in them each are the C processor models, and you'll see the coverage in them is pretty decent. You know, uh, but for example, the first one says that it's 96.9%, which is not 100%. 
And the question is, why? You know, what, why would we not be getting 100% coverage? Is there something, you know, what are we doing wrong? Uh, again, a, a, a question to, uh, uh, to think about. Uh, that top one I mentioned, uh, that's the one you, you, uh, you could buy that smartphone uh, today if you want it. Um, sadly, I don't have it. It's, this is a previous generation, but still. Um, okay, so going back to the, the question from a while ago. So the constraint generator can fail. Why? Well, there's two reasons, or two ways. One is that the constraints themselves are inconsistent. There is no solution. Um, that means there's a, uh, somebody made a mistake. There's a bug in the, uh, in the constraint source. How does that happen? Well, it uh, the, for the most part, these constraints get written uh, by, uh, or the original source language gets written by the, uh, the designers. And people don't usually write new code. What they do is they cut and paste from old code. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, somebody you know, cuts something somewhere, pastes it into another place, and forgets to change everything they needed to change. You know, so an inconsistent constraint would be something like the user meant to say that the value of operand, you know, zero, the first, uh, the, 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 the zeroth operand should be between, ze uh, say, between three and ten, and they accidentally put the, uh, the greater than less than signs in the wrong order, and they said it must be less than three and greater than ten simultaneously, which of course is not possible, so the constraint fails. Uh, so. That's a, you know, that, that's a bug, tends to be relatively easy to find, um, relatively easy to fix, good to know. The second way that the constraints can fail is basically the, the constraints aren't inconsistent, it's just that constraint solving is an NP hard problem and the constraint solver can say, I give up, right? I ran out of memory or I ran out of time uh, and I was unable to solve the problem. What do you do about that? Well. One thing you can do is to give the solver more memory or more time. That sometimes works, but not usually. Yeah, usually the better approach, or usually what you end up having to do, is to rewrite the constraint, because there's more than one way to, uh, to, um, uh, to say the same thing. And sometimes a, uh, there's a simpler way to, to say what you meant that the solver likes better. So that's kind of a, that could be a bit of a voyage of discovery, I guess I would say. So another, I mentioned the, uh, the error checking uh, piece that we find errors earlier than we had, uh, had done in the past. This is one of the places that we find uh, uh, earlier errors earlier. So we're generating the constraints and in fact, if you think about uh, the, the test bench, that little constraint class is a test bench all by itself. You can go and execute that thing in isolation, separate from the design, separate from the rest of the RTL test bench. So uh, when you're trying to debug issues in your constraints, you're looking at you know, 100 or 150 lines or 200 lines of uh, system verilog code, not 100,000 lines of, uh, of your actual design model in, the real, in your real test bench. That can be quite a handy, um, that can be quite helpful. The, the other thing, of course, is that we've, we've written these tools so that our users are running the tools. In past projects, we would uh, have people sending us constraints or sending us stuff that we would then generate and we would come back to them and say, oh, by the way, there's a bug, right? You're, you're, you're referring to a variable that doesn't exist. Your constraint is inconsistent. You know, what is it that you really meant? And that turnaround time is ugly because we are here and most of our users, most of our designers are in Taiwan, uh, which is, a, uh, is 12 hours away. So it, means it meant that for any bug, the minimum turnaround was 24 hours, which is not so great. We wrote some of these tools so that our users run them themselves, and if so, if they find a, you know, when the when the tool generates the constraints, it also tells them. By the way, it was inconsistent, and the user can solve the problem at that point, uh, which helps. But wait, there's more. Ginsu knives. I mentioned we generate a lot of different stuff. Okay, uh, so let's talk for a minute about some of that other different stuff that we can generate. So we already uh, mentioned the system parallel constraints, the test bench, and the constraint solutions, okay, that we're going to use for, uh, for, uh, for places. There's something else we can generate that would be what we, what we think of as a checker block or an error check block in the C model itself. And what would that look like? So this is a small uh, uh, C code check block that says the same thing as the constraint. So it's basically derived from the same source. And all it says is that this instruction 
uh, execution or th uh, this instruction instantiation, you've called, you've called my instruction and you passed it some values. And the values you passed it are okay provided that the source and destination register don't overlap and provided that your uh, register is within the register file and provided that blah, 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 right? So all those different things that the, that the model or that the constraint says must be true, we can check in the C code that are they true? And, uh, and if they're not true, right, the, the error check fails or the check fails, then we can do something about it in the simulator. For example, print an error message or assert out or ignore it or, you know, whatever it is we want to do, we, uh, uh, we can do. Uh, that, again, you know, why would we need that, right? Because the constraint, the, the constrained test bench is only going to generate valid constraints, right? So this will never fail. True. But users sometimes write bad code, right? They make a mistake. Um, and, uh, and so th their, their, their firmware code is incorrect. And uh, basically, the, uh, they've done something that this, uh, the processor does not support. Uh, and it's kind of handy to have the simulator say, by the way, you've got a mistake in your code, as opposed to going out and generating the wrong result or having the RTL code lock up or whatever. You know, something bad will happen. That uh, being able to do error checks is is handy. So how do errors happen? Well, one is the user writes some assembly code and the code is incorrect. Oops. Uh, another way that the, the, uh, that that can happen is the user wrote some code a month ago that was correct a month ago, and then the design changed. Right? We've you know, we added more constraints because of some hardware, uh, uh, either a bug in the hardware or, or something that we uh, that we changed. To that made something that used to be legal is now lo no longer legal, we can tell them, by the way, your code is incorrect. Another way that this happens, which actually turns out to be even more frequent, is these C models and everything I mentioned, we actually generate more than one C model or we have more than one uh, 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 design language. We have a higher level domain specific language is based on C++. The users actually write their firmware code or their algorithm code in this higher level language and it's compiled to object code that then runs on the, uh, on the processor, runs on the design. The compiler itself also undergoes development and the compiler sometimes has bugs. So sometimes the user writes valid code and the compiler just you know, accidentally emits bad code and when they emit bad code, I'm almost done, so that's good. When, the, uh, when the, if the compiler emits bad code, it's kind of nice that the, that the model says, and by the way, the code is bad. Um, that saves the firmware guys really quite substantial time because the, the alternative is, and we generated a wrong result, and what the heck happened there? So, okay, so, we, we're, so we're talking about we're generating the, the constraints, the, 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 the solutions, the error check block. Turns out we actually generate the C models and the simulators themselves. Uh, so we, we're basically generating a lot of stuff. That's handy because all of this stuff that's generated, it's all generated from the same source. So it's all consistent, or it's all internally consistent. So if the source is correct, then everything should be correct. If the source is wrong, then everything is wrong, right? It, but at least it's consistent. We're never in a situation where the, uh, the constraint model says this is legal and the C, uh, the C model says no, it isn't. Right, they're, they're, they're always going to match, for good or bad. It also means if we find a bug or fix something or change something, we change it in one place and it's fixed everywhere. <coughs> so again, that's kind of handy in a, especially in a globally distributed team. Okay, so uh, benefits, very fast turnaround uh, when something changes and things change a lot. Uh, we get these high coverage tests. The high coverage tests m give us quite a lot of confidence to go in and change our C models or to make changes to things uh, because we're quite confident that we'll, if, we if we make a mistake, we will find it. Um, that turns out to be quite a, a, a handy thing. We have consistency between all these different uh, generated components and we're able to do a lot of error checking quite early in the process. Oop, hello. Okay, so you know, always end with a problem, right? It's not, uh, so one particular problem that we have relates to the constraints themselves, right? There are two bugs, two mistakes that you can make in your constraints. You can have over constraints, you can have under constraints. Constraints are basically, in case you didn't already know, you have a search space that's like you know, all possible values. You constrain to say, I'm only gonna look in this subset. 
you can make a mistake. You can say uh, an under constraint says, I only wanted to look into that subset, but actually I've got a bug in my constraint and I'm looking into something bigger. So there are don't cares or there's illegal states in the space I'm searching. Right. We typically catch those. Uh, usually it's the DV guys who catch them. One way that they get caught is the error check blocks and, the, uh, it, uh, and checkers and things in either the C code or the RTL code say, this is not legal, uh, and, and crap out. That's relatively easy to debug because the model is saying, hey, there's something wrong here. I mean, the model itself could be wrong or it could be the constraints, but at least you know there's a problem and you know where to go look. So, you know, not so bad. The other way this manifests is you're, we've given you, uh, you were given a value that's in the don't care space and the C code computed this value and the RTL code computed that value and they're not the same. So we know there's a mistake. And it could be in the C code, it could be the RTL code, it could be the constraints, but, but at least we know that there, it's there and we can go look for it. That's painful and time consuming, but it's, it, it's solvable, right? So under constraints, they cost, they're expensive, they cost time, they cost effort, but they're, they're somewhat solvable. Over constraints, that's the other problem, right? We're, we have this big search space. The, the, the space that we really care about, the valid input space is here, and we've accidentally made a constraint that's looking in some space that's smaller, right? So there are valid inputs that we're never gonna check. Oops, you know, that's not so good, because there could be bugs there. And we actually don't have a very good solution for this um, at the moment. So if you have a good solution, you know, come talk. Whoop, and that's it. <laughs>